that, I'll turn it over to Clay. Before, yeah, before I get started, I want to introduce somebody that came to help me today. Um, Mr. Brian West is in the back from Stockade Staple Guns. Uh, the tools that we use to, to do these projects a lot of times gets overlooked, but they, uh, they make your life so much easier and speed things up. So I'm glad he came today. Uh, he'll show us some tools when we get to the field. Uh, these fencing schools, I guess, with Mr. Chris, started in 2008 and are still going strong today. Why do we need fencing? Um, depending on what, what situation you're in, you may need to be replacing an old fence or you may have bought a property uh, and need to construct a new one. Uh, also, you need to think about are you trying to contain something or keep something out? Uh, this goes back to the planning part that Morgan talked about. Um, depending on what you're trying to do determines what fabric of fence you need, what side of the post it needs to be on, uh, little things that sometimes people don't think about. Uh, wildlife exclusion around here, we have a lot of deer, um, stuff like that. If you have chickens or sheep or something, uh, coyotes can be an issue or wild dogs, uh, all things that need to be thought about when planning. Sometimes you just need to make sure what you own stays at your place. Uh, bulls, cows, stuff like that. Sometimes what we have um, has worked in the past but doesn't work now, needs upgrading. As you can see, this horse here is eating over a traditional barbed wire fence. We're going to try to show you some fences today that will prevent that from happening uh, for a long time. Don't just plan to build a fence, plan to build a system. Uh, we do these schools and do a lot with Gallagher, um, ACI, different companies because we, we are trying to build a system. We want to create a permanent fence around the perimeter uh, and tie it into some of Jeremy's products as far as rotational grazing, temporary fences, watering systems, corral systems. You have to think of everything ahead of time when you're trying to plan to build a fence so you don't have to do it again. Uh, I'm like everybody else, I want a fence once and be done. Consider all your options. Lay out the area you wish to fence on graph paper. We do this a lot um, so you can erase and change things. Include gates, bracing lines. You know, if you're going to be coming in with bush hogs, hay equipment, uh, you know, a 10 foot gate's not going to work a lot of times. You've got to keep all this in mind. Uh, you may need smaller gates in certain places, bigger gates in other places. Um, consider water sources, working facilities like I touched on a while ago. Uh, what type of fence should be used and where. Um, electric fence has its place. High tensile fixed knot fence has its place. Other, other types of fence have theirs. Uh, you need to think about what kind of animals are you trying to keep in or out, like I talked about earlier. And do I need predator control? Um, the goat market and the sheep market has really come on in the last couple of years, and you're seeing more and more of that. When you get into small ruminants like that, predators are a big issue. So you have to think about that as well. Uh, part of planning is knowing your property. Um, if you hadn't been around the property line in a long time and that's where you're going to put the fence, might be a good idea to drive around it and see what kind of obstacles you're going to encounter. This here is a fence we put up and as you can tell we ran into a old brick sidewalk or something there so you kind of have to be prepared for everything. Uh, same way there, this is a pipeline coming in, so they kind of had to change some things and uh, put up, construct a new fence. What options do you have here? Um, there's several different ones. Sometimes stuff like this happens, power lines move, gas lines come through, uh, not much you can do, and you just have to redo your fences and, and change the, the layout of it. Uh, the best way to, to do a fence, uh, to make everything work better, clean up where you're going to put it. Uh, a lot of guys want to just run it right through the middle of where the old fence is. Uh, that's not always the best option. As you'll see when we get to the farm, um, we're going to pull our fence extremely tight and it gets very difficult to do that if you're trying to weave in and out of brush and briars and go around oak trees and everything else. Um, yes, 
if it's a perimeter fence, everybody wants to stay as close to the property line as possible. I understand that. Sometimes you're going to have to do some things different, but try to clean up the property line or the fence line, wherever it's going. Um, if you don't have it, see if you can hire somebody too. It'll make your life a whole lot easier. Use survey flags and paint guns to lay it out. I'll talk about that when we get to the field. Um, a lot of times if I go to farms, people want me to come and kind of give my opinion of how they should do this or how they should do that. You know, and they'll point, oh, up there at the top of the hill by the oak tree, I want to do this. It's hard to see that. Um, so we try to use flags and paint guns. You can move a flag a whole lot easier than you can move a post once it's driven. So it, it, we, uh, we keep going back to the planning, <clears throat> planning, planning, planning. Um, Nobody here wants to fence every day. I, I don't either. So if you plan it and really take your time and do it right the first time, hopefully we won't have to go back and do it again. Uh, once you've planned, have a plan to set on your materials. Uh, wood posts are the most common posts used in this area. You get out west, uh, there's a lot of oil field pipe and, and pipe used. Around here it's primarily T post and wood post. What to consider when sourcing post. Um, as Morgan touched on it a little bit, treated CCA treated post is what we recommend. Um, I'm going to go over a few things. Uh, Southern yellow pine in this area is your best choice. They are selected genetically for straightness, uh, branching, uh, rapid growth, stuff like that. Um, they can withstand more crushing than example red pine or some other type post that you may use and nowadays most contractors are going to be using a post driver so they're going to be taking pressure um, red pine comes out of canada everything else you know the yellow pine is here in the u.s when considering a treated one she talked about the tag on it um, basically the tag is going to tell you how much treatment is in that post um, and, and what you need to consider is getting the correct treatment for the application that you're going to be using it for. Uh, if, if you get a post that, that uses copper arsenate, um, they typically use 0.4 pounds of chemical per cubic foot of wood. Uh, that is good for ground contact, agriculture, fencing, commercial highway use. Um, not considered to run through the middle of a swamp or water. It's, it's ground contact, not water contact. Um, copper azole is what is used in ground contact residential use. It's going to have less treatment. Uh, so residential use will have less treatment than agricultural use. So if we're building a fence, obviously we want more treatment, so we want to try to stay with an agricultural designated post with 0.4 pounds of chemical per foot. Uh, regardless of the treatment of the post, must be dried properly to get treatment all the way. We try to recommend in this area, Madison Post makes a very good post. Um, the process, the treatment process is the most important part. The amount of treatment is important also, but if, if you put the, the amount of treatment on and you don't do the process correctly, it's not going to stay with the post or on the post. Um, the initial vacuum pull surface moisture from the post, um, Madison Post Company, they let their post dry a long time. Yes? Yeah. Yes, you. If there's a post on the market that that would have more treatment than that, I would try to go with that. Um, if not, I would try. If you know, if if there's if it's not really hilly and it's going to not be pulling up on your fence, which we'll talk about that later, I would try to go back to a, a steel T post or something like that in that area. That if it's going to stay wet a lot, um, like I said, these posts are treated for for just ground contact and what moisture comes from rain, not standing in water uh, for long periods of time. Yes, um, the farm we're on actually, I think, uh, has had that issue in the past, so we'll kind of go over some things. Um, nobody can build a fence that's, that's going to stop a flood water, but we will show you how to build a fence that 
once the flooded water comes, you can still maintain it and, and the fence is still usable. Yeah, that's right. Um, and high tensile fence would be your best option in, in that situation. Uh, but back to the post treatment, you've got to let the post dry. Um, some people put them in a vacuum and pull the moisture. Some let them air dry outside, which is probably the best. Uh, then they put them in a cylinder and pressurize them up to 100 p 180 PSI for 7 to 9 minutes, pushing the chemical into the wood, uh, trying to get it all the way down to the core, the heart of the wood. The final vacuum empties the cylinder and pulls the excess chemical from the wood that is not bonded to the cells of the wood. Uh, selecting the best post for the application, um, we'll talk about braces a little today and then when we get to the field we'll go over it a little more. For line post on a fixed knot high tensile fence, which is what Stay Tough uh, promotes and sells, uh, you can space your post further apart so if you're going to use a wood post you need to use a little bit bigger one. Line post can be seven foot to eight foot um, and they need to be three to four, five, four to five, five to six. We recommend the four to fives for line post. On a treated wood post every inch gives you ten more years of life. So on your corner post and where a gate's going to be you know you'll see a lot of people try to skimp and use a five to six inch. Um, yes, that, that may work, but the money difference in a 5 to 6 and a 7 to 8 is not going to be that much different. But you're talking 2 years, you're talking 20, I mean 2 inches, you're talking 20 years roughly uh, of more life. So in the long run, what's that couple extra dollars worth to you? Um, diameter is measured at the top of the post um, and usually around here on a peeled post is in a range of four to five inch, a five to six, a seven to eight. Uh, so when you hear us talk about using six to sevens as, as corner posts, that, that's a, a range of how you buy posts. They're gonna, they're gonna range them from a six to seven inch post. Uh, Did you mention that when people buy posts, they should probably maintain that or make sure they get the post? Yes, and make sure you get the post. We, he, he brought that up because at the last school, um, the woman that owned the farm there, she went and bought post, and they told her they were six to sevens, I think, and we got there and measured them, and they were all five to sixes. So she paid for a bigger post than she actually got. So you kind of got to pay attention. They they made it right, and we exchanged a post. But uh, yes, you need to need to pay attention. Make sure you're getting what you what you paid for. Um, length seven foot's most common um, in line post. In the corner post, we recommend an eight foot, um, and then you know if you get in a real bad swag or something like that, you may need to go to a nine or a ten foot post. Um, horizontals today we're going to use pipe. Um, a lot of guys use wood. Uh, we try to use a brace rail that's roughly two and a half times the height of the fence. So if you put up a four foot fence, a ten foot brace rail, and we'll go over that a little more when we get to the field. Um, it's all about angles and. Uh, stuff like that is why we need a longer brace rail. Um, taper on a post in an eight foot is usually one inch different from the top to the bottom. Landscape timbers and perfect post. All right, Tr we try to stay away from dimensional lumber. Uh, four by fours, landscape timbers, all that kind of stuff is cut and tr and trimmed out of the heart of the wood to make it perfect. Same way with perfect posts. You can go to some farm stores and you can buy a six inch post and it's six inch from one end to the top. It's, uh, it's, it's trimmed out of the heart. When you do that, you take meat off, off the tree itself. So we do not recommend perfect posts. We do not recommend dimensional lumber, four by four, six by six, and stuff like that. Over time, they will rot and they will bow like that. Um, we try to use peeled posts, which you'll see today. A peeled post, um, they, they peel the bark off of, treat it, and whatever natural crook or bend or whatever is in it is in it for life. Um, so when you go to driving it or go to laying it out, you can sort of take all that in advantage. Uh, we drove some posts yesterday that were very crooked, but you won't be able to tell it because we drove them and we took that into consideration. If you buy a perfect post and you drive it straight in three or four years, it's going to be crooked where it gets a bow in it most of the time because they have trimmed meat off of it to make it perfect. Uh, and we want to try to avoid that and stay away from that. Hey, the, um, those perfect posts that are kind of the heart of the tree, mm -hmm. do they take treatment as well as 
uh, no, not not exactly because you you know you may have a thicker piece of flesh wood, I guess you would call it on one side than the other because they have trimmed it out. So it's it's not a consistent amount of fibers, uh, I guess is the right term. Is that the kind of post you buy like your on the big box floor? Um yes, a lot of them carry that. Um yeah, and I see tons of people using four by fours and landscape timbers for brace rails. Um Landscape timber is going to be a uh, residential treatment if they have any treatment at all, which we saw back earlier is going to be a fourth of the treatment of a normal treated fence post. Yeah, and and a, and a four before um, is is the same way. It's going to have less treatment than a agricultural fence post, um, and also they're trimmed the same way and cut the same way as a perfect post. So after a while, they're going to bow, uh, and what that does when they bow your Brace rails, I mean your brace posts come in, um, create slack in your brace wire, then your brace is going to fail eventually. Uh, also, decorative posts like these, uh, we don't recommend those either. Um, anytime you cut it like that, you are exposing the treatment, uh, which those are going to be back to the residential treatment anyway, so they're going to have a, roughly a fourth of the amount of treatment as an agricultural post. All right, so we've got it all planned. Uh, we've bought the material, and we are ready to begin. Uh, this here is just a picture of a post driver like we're going to see operate today. Um, we drive all our posts if possible. Um, a driven post, we've done tests at our facility in Texas. A driven post is nine times stronger than a traditional dug post. I don't care if you dig it out and tamp it all day long. You'll never get it back to it, the way it was before you dug out the ground. Uh, we don't recommend concrete. Concrete holds moisture. When you hold moisture around the same spot around a post for long periods of time, you're going to create rot. So we want to drive our post if possible. Um, if you're not going to hire anybody to build your fence, at least hire them to come drive the post. Um, you'll see today you can feel the post. We drove them yesterday and we pulled the wire on them yesterday. Um, they didn't move a muscle. So there's a big difference in a tamped post, traditional tamped post, and a driven post. And now, today, with the equipment that everybody has, um, you can drive a post no time. You don't have to sharpen them. You don't have to do all that kind of stuff. Uh, it is fast and the way we recommend to do it. Yes, sir. We do. Um, around here, you'll really see it. As you can tell on this picture, I don't know if you can see it, but he's got a rock auger beside uh, the, the post there. I don't know if you can tell it, but anyway, it swings out, drill a pilot hole uh, that is still smaller than the post. So uh, that's one option. Uh, sometimes you do get into rock um, or some type of ground where even drilling a pilot hole won't work and you have to dig it whole and tamp it in. Uh, you're going to get into those situations, yes, I know. Uh, most post drivers now come with the option of either a rock spike, and basically all that does is drive a spike down through where you're going to put a hole, I mean a post, and bust the rock out, or an auger like in this situation, a, a pilot hole auger. Uh, so it's still smaller than the post, so you're still not having to tamp around the post, uh, but you're creating uh, an opening for the post to start through the rock or the hard shell or whatever you got. But yes, you will get into situations where driving is just not an option. Can, can you just mention Jody on the show some rock augers? Yes, he will. J uh, Jody, he left the room now, but he'll have some equipment on his trailer that has rock augers. Uh, the post driver we used yesterday does not have an auger on it, but you can get one on it, uh, like in the picture here. Uh, on the skid steer or the previous picture. So several different options there. Uh, and that's basically what we just talked about. Some situations, you know, you're going to have to dig by hand uh, up against a building or something like that. Uh, there's just no way to avoid it. But we try to drive the post if possible. Uh, H-braces. We'll go over this a lot in the field. They are the foundation of the fence. I don't care what kind of fence you put up, what kind of wire, how pretty everything else looks. If you don't build the braces right, it's not going to work. Uh, we recommend a single H brace with a, with a brace rail 
two and a half times the height of the fence, which is what I touched on earlier. So today you're going to see a 10 foot brace rail because the fence is roughly four foot tall. Uh, what that does is create, I don't know if this thing has a pointer or not. Does this thing have a red dot pointer on it? Yep, it does. Let me see. Uh, it's right here. The big button on top? Yeah. Okay. The longer your brace rail is, the less steep your brace wire is. Uh, I know everybody here has probably drove up and down the road and your neighbor started out with a four foot post here and here. Next year he's got a four and a half foot post here and here. The next year he's got a five foot post here. He's growing a fence post. What has happened is his brace rail is too short and your angle on your wire is pulling up instead of back like it's supposed to. And, and we'll go over this in the field a lot. It'll make a little more sense there when you can see it. But we want to use a long enough brace rail to keep this around 30 degrees or less. If you get much over 30 degrees, you're pulling up on your post instead of together. Uh, a lot of people use double braces. Um, I think that's on the next slide. Yeah, double braces. Uh, I'll also go over this in the field a little more because it's uh, more of a visual thing. We recommend a single brace at these schools. Um, a single brace there's no post in the center to have to worry about. If you get this center post out of line in any direction, all you've created is a joint uh, to swivel right there and for your brace to fail. This 16 foot brace, I'm assuming those are two eight foots, is no stronger than one single 10 foot brace. Um, a lot of contractors do it and if you build fence every day, Yes, you can do a double brace and it's great. If you don't build fence every day and you get this post right here out of line the slightest, you've created a hinge for that and your brace will fail. That is the reason we don't recommend a double brace. We stay with a single brace. And today I'll show you, we're going to build two braces. We'll go over how to lay it out and, and how we build a brace uh, the correct way. Take time to do it right. We're going to go over that and we're going to show you that today. Um, everything, how to do it the proper way. Line post. All right. I, I, I work for Stay Tough, which is a high tensile fixed knot fence. Um, if you're not familiar with, with it, um, I'm sure everybody is familiar with a high tensile electric fence, smooth wire. Same wire, just in a fixed knot woven type pattern. Um, when you go to a high tensile fence versus your low carbon fence um, like the big box stores carry and, and that your grandpa used 50 years ago, you can space your posts so much further apart because high tensile wire stretches less than 1% over its life. Low carbon wire is going to stretch more than 10%. Um, the advantage to this is you can space your posts further apart, it follows the ground better, um, and your overall cost is going to be cheaper. Um, in Texas, where this company is based out of, uh, it's flat out there. A lot of times they'll put their line posts on 25 foot centers. I'm from Tennessee. Um, where I live is actually pretty flat. I live in West Tennessee. Around here is fairly flat. There's some hills. Um, 15 to 20 is what we recommend around here. Now if you're going through a ditch or up a big hill or something like that, yes, you're, you will have to tighten them back up. But just flat to rolling heels with a high tensile fixed knot fence, you can go around here 20 feet pretty easy. Uh, on the farm we did yesterday, we put the post on 20 foot centers. Um, you will see that that setup has the same cost per foot or maybe a little cheaper than a traditional five strand bob wire fence with T-post every eight foot. Um, so at the end of the day, for the same money, you can have a woven wire fence on all wood posts for the same money or maybe cheaper than you can have a five strand bob wire fence. Uh, this really plays into effect around here. There's some heels here. Um, the wire is going to run with the ground. Uh, I see a lot of people put the post in level. Um, no matter what the ground is, they put it in level. That's not how the wire runs. So although it looks different to people who've never seen it, we try to put the post perpendicular with the ground, not level. 
as you can see in the picture here, uh, that's the level and that's the post. When you put the post in level, it's not going to run with the stays of the fence, and so you're going to be putting more pressure on some wires than others. So we want to run the fence perpendicular with the ground, just like the animal would walk down it. That way your stays line up, and, and it's equal pressure on each line and each staple on the post. Uh, that's sort of something that some people haven't seen and, and don't necessarily like the look of a lot of times. But like I said earlier, nobody wants to fence every day. They want to do it, and they want to not come back for 20 years. This is one of the small things that makes a big difference. Um, if you put that in level, you can cause stress on certain parts of the post or the fence to cause failure. <clears throat> and this is just another picture showing. You can see here that's, that's, the, that's level, and then you can see how the fence is running. So if he was to put the post in level and not perpendicular with the ground, uh, you know, it's all going to be out of whack. Uh, try for perfection. We'll kind of talk about laying it out today and how we try to get everything straight. Um, these guys here, this is a picture of a contractor. They don't use a string, uh, but they build fence every day, so they have a guy that sights them all. Yesterday we used a string, um, and they're pretty pretty straight. Uh, he's That guy's really good. Uh, paying out wire, basically unrolling wire, um, we're just going to unroll it by hand today, but that's an old machine that guy out west had that all that does is unroll the wire. So just a picture. Once the line posts are driven and the braces are built, you're ready to put up the wire. Um, you'll see today on a high tensile fixed knot fence, we want to tie off to each brace and unroll it and we pull from the center. Uh, you're when you pull from the center, you're in more control of getting the top and the bottom sections of the fence equal tension, and uh, you can do more things with it if you have to go over heels and stuff like that. So we will terminate to the corner post. We will tie off to the corner post, and we will unroll, and we will pull in the center. Um, that's sort of something that people don't see a whole lot, so we're going to show you how we do that today. On high tensile fence, if it's fairly straight to rolling, I mean, if you're crossing a gully or something, this may not work, but roughly four rolls, so 1,300 feet uh, with a single brace on each end. That is also the difference in high tensile wire and low carbon hinge joint woven wire. Traditional woven wire, you're going to have to have a brace at every roll, the end of every roll, so every 330 feet per se. With high tensile fixed knot fence, you only need a brace every 1,300 feet. An H brace doesn't do any good unless you stop and tie off to it and then re-pull. Uh, if you just pull past it and nail it to it, it's not doing any more than a, just a regular wood post sitting there. So that will save you time and money. You don't have to build braces every 330 feet. You can build a brace at each end of the run. Around here, I don't know that you'd get a 1,300 foot run. Um, in Texas, out west, they do that all the time. Around here, four or five hundred feet is probably as far as you're going to get. Um, this goes back to talking about what you're trying to keep in or out, selecting fence fabric. I'll go over it a little more. Uh, when we get to the field, I'll show you a tag. All our wires have three numbers, and I, I wish I had a slide on here. I don't, I don't think it's on here, but anyway... Uh, for perimeter fences, you can go with a larger stay, which means the spacing in between the verticals is further. You can go to like a 12-inch stay, save you a little weight and a little money. Um, 949, 842, yes? Stay yeah, the stay, the stay in a fence, in a traditional hinge joint fence, um, it wraps around one strand, it comes up and wraps around and a separate piece goes to each strand. So you have separate pieces of wire going vertical up the fence. In a traditional, I mean in a hinge joint, that is how it works. In a fixed knot fence like we sell, we have one stay, one solid wire from the top to the bottom and then a separate wire that ties the patented fixed knot. So it ties the vertical stay to the horizontal line and those knots take 200 pounds a piece to move them. So when you see the fence, it'll make a little more sense and I'll go over it again. But on perimeter fences, to save a little time and money, you can go with a 
Further stay spacing, 12 inch stays is pretty common on a perimeter fence, 94912, which is a 49 inch tall fence, nine horizontal lines, 12 inch spacing. If you go to a catch pin, a weaning pin, some type of area where there's a little more pressure, you could go back to a six inch stay or even a three inch stay. Um, obviously the more wire you have in it, the stronger the fence is. Uh, to take impact and, and stuff like that. So, you know, if, if you've got a little lot you're gonna wean some calves in or something like that, I would recommend going back to a, a six inch stay or something like that. Sheep and goat people, we make a, a four inch stay so they can't get their head in it. Um, and that's basically what this here is. And, and also, you, you know, if you're in a weaning pen or a high pressure system, a crowding pen or sorting pen or something like that, you may want to move your post back to 10 foot and, and use a closer stay fence uh, to hold the pressure a little better. Uh, I would recommend using high tensile wire if possible. Whether you use electric fence, whether you use a fixed knot fence here like this is, uh, most of your high tensile wire is, is going to have a lower installation cost. It's going to have at least class 3 galvanization or better. Uh, ours actually has a little better than class 3 galvanization. Uh, it has greater memory and it'll stress stretch less than 1%, which is the big deal in a fence. Um, greater breaking strength. Basically, we're building a, a vertical trampoline. Uh, we'll see today, we want that animal to hit the fence and bounce off of it without breaking anything or causing damage to the fence wire itself. And that's basically what we're doing with high tensile fence. Um, today we're using uh, this exact wire here, actually 94912, 660. It's kind of hard to see right there. I'll show you the tag when we get to the field. But basically if you go to the store and you look for one, the first three numbers, the first number is the number of horizontal lines. So this is a 949. So that means there's nine horizontal lines. 49 is how tall the fence is, so it's 49 inches tall. The second number is the spacing in between the vertical stays. So this here is 12, so that means it's 12 inches from this stay to the next stay. And then the last number, 660, that's just the amount of feet per that in that roll. That roll happens to be a 660 foot roll. Today we'll be using 330 foot rolls. And those numbers go back to rods and square acres. And don't get me started on that, I don't know all that. But that's where the numbers come from. These are some machines in Houston. We have nine machines that make these fixed knot uh, fences. Uh, it's just basically tying the knots here and then this is re-rolling it. That's a good picture of the actual fixed knot there. That's a six inch fence. Um, and you can see the stay right here, vertical stay, one solid stay, and then you got your separate wire tying them together. Or in a traditional hinge joint fence, you're going to wrap around that one, come up here and wrap around, and then a new piece of wire goes from there to there, new piece from there to there. So what that does is create a hinge. This fence does not hinge because it's one solid piece. Uh, it springs back. Uh, these are some pictures. The local airport in New Brunsville, um, where... The office is, they have a little airport there and this plane crashed and actually caught it in the fence. Uh, this is in Virginia, muddy situation here. The guy's track or skid steer got away from him and ran into the fence and the fence stopped it. Uh, I'm not going to guarantee it didn't break that post off right there, but the wire did not fail. It stopped the skid steer. I don't know what that skid steer weighs, probably 8,500 pounds or so. so. Uh, this is another picture of just out west, or even up here, I guess, um, ice. You, that's a big issue around here, ice on the fence. This fence here may sag a little, but it will pop back because it's high tensile fence. Uh, here's some high water marks like the man earlier was talking about. Um, in this situation, they try to use steel posts, and you can see here where the water's been up here. Um, it didn't push this fence over, luckily. A lot of times, like you were talking in your floodplain, it, it may push the fence over and bend your T-post, but if you get the T-post out of the fence, the fence wire will come back. So I can't tell you how to build a fence that the T-post don't bend over, but I can tell you how to build a fence that the wire won't get damaged. Um, in this situation, if the wire had laid over, and I have seen it a lot, um, just cut the clips and get the T-post out of there and the fence will stand back and, and you can re either straighten your T-post up and re-put them back in the ground or something like that. 
Um, that's why they don't use wood post here primarily because if you, you know if you break a wood post off then you got something left in the ground where here a T post if it bends over you can get it out of the ground and re either rebend it and reuse it or buy a new T post but the wire will withstand flood and, and garbage in the water pushing on it uh, different obstacles if you use high tensile fence you can kind of get away with some stuff that you can't with regular uh, low carbon wire. This here was some old stumps that somebody fenced over the top of. Um, you know, normally on a hinge joint that would be all mashed down because it has a hinge in every square. This is a solid stay so it's keeping it stood upright. So you can get away with going over some obstacles that you normally couldn't. Uh, high tensile fence uh, adjusts easy to topography of the ground. Here's a big, uh, big gully inside of a hill here. Uh, we did a fence school with another uh, company or another university in Tennessee, I guess two weeks ago, and, and we fenced across a gully. And when we pulled the wire tight, you know, it was above our head and we all stood on it and steepled it down. Um, so it really is good to use on hilly ground. It, it will work and stay tight where traditional low carbon wire will not. Yes? Um, we normally try to at least be able to put your foot under it to keep it just uh, enough off the ground that it's not staying in moisture and that like this farm we're going to today, he could weed eat under it. Uh, if you get much further than that, you can get some cows trying to stick their nose under it and stuff like that. So, so you, there's sort of a fine line in there. You can put it on the ground. Um, most people raise it up, you know, just a couple inches enough to, to get a weed eater under it. Uh -huh. That's right. Uh, no, I, I would try, you know, if you've got a hump or an old stump hole or something like that, I would try to level that out and get it right. Um, but, you know, if you run over a stump, yes, it would be touching the stump, obviously. But if you've just got a hump, before I put the fence up, I would try to get the humps out and get the ground sort of level and back to rolling. I know you can't always do that. But, uh, yes, it's not going to hurt it if it's on the ground. So if, if it is touching the ground in between two posts when you go over a, a molehill or something, it's not a big deal. Um, if it's tight enough and, and it's not that big of a rise, a lot of times it, if you pick it up on this post and pick it up on this post, it will keep it up in the middle. It's not always going to happen, but uh, it won't hurt it if it's on the ground. We just try to raise it up off the ground a little to be able to weed eat or mow under it or whatever. Uh, we stretch from the center or the end, depending on the pool. Today we're going to stretch from the center with these stretcher bars here like, like in the picture. When you do this, you can control the top and the bottom tension a whole lot better than uh, you know if you use some type of old traditional 6 by 6s uh, bolted together. Um, we will crimp it together. Uh, the crimps that we use have a special grid in them. You'll see they're harder than the wire. So when you crimp them, they bite into the wire. Um, and I've actually broke a chain and the crimp didn't break, so that's pretty good. Okay. Uh, it's just a picture here of the planning coming together in the, the fence. He's building a system here. Splice and go. We'll see that here today when we put the fence up. We splice it. You're going to have to tie two rolls together anyway, so why not just pull them in the center and splice it once? Uh, anybody can do it. We'll ha take some volunteers today. You can see there's, it's not near as difficult as it sounds. Um, fixed knot and electric make a great combination. Jeremy will talk about this um, today, and you can see that today at the farm. We, we recommend an offset if you want to. Um, that way you can tie onto this electric and run temporary fence for rotational grazing, things of that nature. Uh, but we, we do kind of recommend a uh, fixed knot fence here for the perimeter in this situation, but he does have an offset which is an option. Uh, decide what you need and go for it. Uh, summary, basically, take your time, plan out what you want to do. Uh, that way you can do it once and it's right and you don't have to go back. Uh, don't burn dollars trying to save pennies. Uh, we get this every time somebody wants to use Locust Post or something that they got for free. Yes, they may work and they may last forever, but traditionally they're not going to last as much as a chemically treated post. So. That's the biggest thing. Don't burn dollars saving pennies. 
Um, we're, we're trying to build a fence that lasts 30 plus years, so we don't want to have to go back and fix the post. Uh, don't use, use corrosive materials on your fence, um, and then we try to promote a low maintenance fence like you will see today. Uh, any questions? Uh, your copper arsenate treatment 24 mm -hmm. is that post treated all the way through 100%? Supposed to be, yes, sir. Yep. And and we recommend uh, we try not to cut the post. Um, anytime you cut it, you're going to expose it kind of to it uh, because it is pressure treated and it is to the heart, but it's sealed on both ends. So if you cut it, you it's still got treatment, but it's not sealed off as good. So you know if you're driving a post and you lack a couple inches, just leave it. You can, um, and I can't think of the name of it off the top of my head, but uh, Lowe's, places like that sell um, outdoor treatment that you can put on a post if you do have to cut one off or something so like that. you're sharpening the post to drive them and you're damaging the post? Uh, yes, we try not to sharpen them if, if we don't have to. And they don't drive a straight and sharpen That's right. They, they tend to go to one yeah, if they hit an obstacle, they will go. When you drive them, do you use a small wind? We do, yes, and and we will talk about that when we drive them. And I didn't touch on the, the cost. He had a question earlier on the cost. I don't know for every fence, but, but I know the contractors I work with on a traditional fixed knot fence with a strand of bob wire on the top, which is pretty common cow fence, um, most of the time the cost is going to be double the material. So if you've got $2,000 worth of materials, the labor is going to be around $2,000. Somewhere in the ballpark of 350, 375 a foot can kind of get most of it, uh, material, labor, and all. I'm not going to guarantee that that'll get it, but most of the contractors I work with is going to be in that ballpark. So, easy figuring 375 a foot will get labor and materials. Now, most people charge per brace and stuff like that because if you build a square and you only got four braces, that's not going to take as long as building 10. So, you kind of have to take that into consideration too. But. So one thing to mention about fencing contractors, if, if you're looking for one, it, it's going to take a while to get them there. Uh, it's a good one to come get. If you've got one that's going to be tomorrow, then you probably don't want to be using it. So, so uh, be patient if you're going to use a fencing contractor. Let's thank Clay for his presentation.